Hello again, this is Swati from the softwaretestinghub.com team and in this segment we'll talk about decision tables. Um, decision tables are actually uh, one of the tools that software testing teams use in order to be able to test better. Um, now if I have to categorize decision tables into a genre, I would say decision tables belong to the category of analytical tools, something that help us understand the system better. And we all know the significance of how, uh, I mean, uh, the significance of, you know, testers understanding the system better than anybody, you know, so to test it in a way that, you know, um, the end users would find it consistent with, you know, what is it that they are expecting to do and also the business teams would find it consistent with what kind of business targets that this system is supposed to achieve. And we we are we all look into um, I mean we are all always wor working with systems that have uh, very complex, very intricate, very composite functions, right? So decision tables are the perfect tool that we can use in order to analyze the system better, in order to uh, figure the testing, um, you know, uh, the, the, the testing aspects, the aspects that have to be tested uh, to correctly exploit this business logic. Um, so it, it, all of these things are going to be much clearer when we use the concept of decision tables. So in this segment, we are going to look at what decision tables are basically, why are they used, how can they be created, and what is its significance with respect to testing. Now to take this topic forward, I have an already created decision table um, which we will use first to figure out how to analyze using it. So let's, for example here, I mean decision tables always think about what is the case in hand? What is the business logic? What is the data that you want to represent in the form of a table? Decision tables, when you are worrying about, I mean, when you are wondering whether a decision table is a perfect fit for the case that you have on hand, um, always think about whether your business logic talks about various ranges of input data and different processing logics that are applied to it. So here the example that I have is for a mortgaging or, you know, a financial services organization um, that specializes in lending loans. Now none of these interest values are, you know, uh, accurate or in line with the statutory rules, but this is just for the sake of an example. Now if the principal loan amount is anything that is $4,000 or below, uh, then it is interest free. Then if the interest amount is $4,000, um, above $4,000 and below $5,500, the initial $4,000 is going to be, uh, you know, uh, tax free. I mean interest free sorry and then the rest of the amount that is over 4000 and under 50, uh, under you know uh, 5500 uh, that amount is calculated at an interest of 10% similarly uh, different price ranges different amounts exist and different kinds of processing is happening on this now to create a decision table it's actually very simple we'll actually create one to get a real feel of it uh, but the real value of the decision table is trying to write something in the form of a table which makes it very, very clear, which makes it very, very transparent versus writing it in, in a paragraph form. So I have written uh, how it would look like in a paragraph for just these two columns. Um, so the first line it says that when there are different kinds of input, each input undergoes different computations or processing. In that case, a decision table is an apt tool to use for analysis and better understanding, for better transparency of the system. Now, again, as I said, if we, if I were to translate this into, um, you know, it, it, assume that decision table versus a paragraphic representation of the con content, then it would look something like this. If the amount borrowed is less than or equal to $4,000, then it is interest free. If the amount borrowed is more than $4,000 and less than $5,500, then the first $4,000 are interest free and the amount that is over $4,000 is if less than $1,500. So you see, it's a lot of uh, content, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of words and there is a there's plenty of room in this kind of representation for uh, misunderstanding and you know um, you know miscalculating um, the computation rules. So 
Decision tables and cases like that are a perfect way to understand the business logic. Now, in order to test this system completely, now, you know, um, one thing is, what is decision table? It is just a table of representation of different input datas and different computations that, you know, uh, are applied to it. How are they created? It is very simple. I will show you a very, very simple exam going, uh, example going forward. Um, uh, how are they created? I mean, how can we use them for testing? That is the question that we always ask ourselves. What is the significance of this? How do we apply this in uh, a practical sense? Now, let's assume that, you know, you are working on testing the system and you're given this decision table on how the system works. Um, now, field level testing, testing every component of the UI, that is one layer. Definitely, it is important. Definitely, it, it has its place. It has its significance, which means we are going to focus on that. But beyond that, uh, the core business functionality, or, you know, the core business logic is what needs to um, be paid a lot of attention to, definitely. Uh, so now that when I'm trying to design my test cases, I would actually choose a value that is representative of the amount one. So I'm going to choose something that is, um, again, probably, uh, I actually like to choose more than one value because one value probably is not always representative of what needs to happen. So I would choose a value like $1,000, uh, something that is in the border of $4,000 and probably, a, you know, just the border itself. Uh, so when I make sure that it is working fine for any amount that is less than 1,000 uh, on the border of, I'm um, sorry, less than 4,000 on the border of, you know, $4,000 and for the $4,000 itself and the right computation logic that if uh, everything is interest-free, I'm going to be uh, satisfied with it. Similarly with amount 2, I'm again going to test for the border, the 4,001. I'm again going to look at... Um, you know, uh, 5,500. So if I'm uh, placing an amount that is exactly on the boundary, how does it work? Then 5,499 and something that is in between, something that is like, say, $5,000. So similarly, so this gives me a very clear idea on what values should I choose in order to exploit these business functionality and, you know, to check whether the computation is happening accurately or not. So similarly, you can you get the picture on how to take it for other things. Now, which again brings us to the question, when does QA teams decide that they need to draw a decision table, right? Now, the thing is, uh, we are the ones who needs to understand the system very well. But... Prior to us, I mean, if a business logic has to be tested, the underlying assumption is that the business logic has to be built into the system prior to being tested, right? So if it has to be built into the system, the teams that have to understand this business logic very, very well would be the implementation teams, which are essentially the BA and the dev teams. So chances are that in most projects, if there is a complex business logic being implemented, these kind of decision tables will already be drawn up, will already be available. So in that case, you can actually simply refer to it. So if it's already drawn up, you will find it in one of the reference documents like the technical design, uh, functional design, or the BRD, or any other reference documents that the team keeps. Uh, so my experience with the decision tables has been that QA teams do not have to draw them up from scratch. Uh, they just need to know how to use them, when to use them, when they might be applicable. But if you need to use them, uh, let's draw up a simple decision table for a company where, you know, they have permanent and, uh, uh, you know, um, so if it is a permanent employee and we have, um, you know, um, temporary employees or, you know, part-time employees. So for permanent employees, the number of work hours is 8, right? So for um, the part-time employee, the number of work hours is according to how many ever hours they work. Um, and then they might need, um, you know, uh, when, it, when it comes to leave, 10 paid leaves for the, you know, permanent employee and no paid leaves for the temporary employees. So they might be part-time employees. So they might actually, you know, if when they don't work, they don't get paid. Um, 
no paid leave um so and then you know uh, there will be all kinds of you know taxations and all that employed so here the input is whether they are a permanent employee or not so the employee information that gets sup uh, supplied to the system is the employee id assuming whether and the employee id there are two kinds of inputs here broadly the id of a permanent employee and the id of a temporary employee so if it is the id of a temporary employee permanent employee the things that i have the, we will have to look is um you know how many um, i mean what is the uh, salary that they are supposed to get um, paid leaves how many have they levied and all of that so for uh, a part time employee paid leaves are going to be zero salary would not be fixed so here it is a fixed salary um taxes sorry uh, fixed salary leaves taxes other benefits so permanent employee salary is calculated based on a fixed salary uh the number of paid leaves that have been used in a particular month uh percentage of taxes that are levied on it other benefits like you know um other allowances like gas allowances and you know um dress allowances and all that so a uh, part time employee the salary is number of uh, calculated on number of hours worked leaves uh paid leaves are zero taxes again you know certain amount of percentage that is levied other benefits you know maybe may not have you know allowances or different allowances or no allowances so all of these are different so the input that you get is the employee id which has two different categories and there are different computation logics applied on the kind of input that is provided so i mean when you have the actual data for all of these things this would start to look like a decision table so decision table is very simple to draw up now usually as i said it might already be in existing in your system in in your company in your you know reference documents but if it doesn't it just takes about you know 5 or 10 minutes and a very good understanding of what the business logic is to draw this up and using it is super simple see uh, now that this table is so clear i can actually put the uh, data right there and figure out if i have covered every possible scenario or not um so decision tables are really great in analyzing the system and actually trying to fill the gaps that testing teams might have in terms of uh, business logic understanding so as always we hope that this segment has been useful and if you have any questions please do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, by commenting below or sending us uh, a, you know an email or anything like that thank you so much